Welcome all Expo participants. Uh, my talk is the saltwater effect, fact or fiction. My name is Greg Lane. My call sign is N4KGO. Uh, if you'd like to catch up on my story, it's on QSO Today, episode 30. Uh, in brief, I was first licensed as a teenager in 1967, dropped out for 25 years, starting in 1983. In 2008, I got relicensed uh, up to extra. Uh, almost all my operating is in the outdoors here in Northwest Florida. I enjoy rapid deployment, amateur radio, also known as radar, field days, QRP, amateur satellites, and CW. I'm an active member of the Panama City Amateur Radio Club. Uh, through my work experience, I have skills in relational database design and Microsoft Access application development. Uh, the good news is I'm recently retired and hoping to uh, enjoy amateur radio even more. Uh, this is just a little video segment. Uh, uh, in the presentation, I'd like you to find out why I like the beach for ham radio. Good morning, this is Greg, N4KGL. I'm at uh, St. George Island uh, for uh, the Radar Challenge. Uh, it is April 1st, uh, 2017, and actually I think I'm in Radar Heaven here. Uh, Northwest Florida, uh, I'm on the beach, and uh, it just couldn't, the weather is in the 70s, and uh, clear skies, so I'm really blessed to be able to do amateur radio outdoors, uh, so we're going to really have fun today. <laughs> All right. Well, if you notice, I was uh, near the salt water. Uh, the uh, talk is about the salt water effect, which is also known uh, by some as the salt, wa salt water amplifier effect. Uh, my definition of the salt water effect is it's the enhancement of HF communications when using vertical antennas near the salt water shore. Uh, the motivation of my study that I'm going to fill you in on is to determine if I can measure the saltwater effect to confirm my anecdotal experience. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to present results of limited experiments I've done to encourage a critique by the citizen scientists in our ranks and to lay uh, the groundwork for continued studies. Uh, the saltwater effect has its advocates. Uh, uh, first, I'll mention Tom uh, Golf Zero Sugar Baker Whiskey. Uh, he uses the saltwater effect uh, to advantage for his pedestrian mobile ops uh, over in the UK. Uh, his talk in this expo, uh, which should have been given previously, is the saltwater amplifier key to SSBDX. Also a big advocate is the Team Vertical Contest Group. Uh, they had uh, outstanding contest results using vertical antennas on the beach. And they also have done their own experiments for the saltwater effect. Um, one note, um, these advocates recommend to have your salt have the salt water between your antenna and the desired context. Well, my anecdotal experience uh, is I feel I have better luck making contacts on the salt water shore uh, using vertical antennas. Uh, of course, there are many opportunities to visit the salt water shore here in Northwest Florida. I often can hold down a frequency and have stations calling me even when operating QRP. I've done fairly well in QRP events like Flight of the Bumblebees. 
One day while operating pedestrian mobile, I found a dramatic increase in the signal I was receiving as I walked toward the saltwater shore. Uh, this was really a, a sign to me that uh, this uh, saltwater effect is uh, something I should investigate further. Um, San Andrews State Park is nearby, is one of my favorite saltwater effect locations. Uh, the park itself is this green area here. Um, I have several spots I operate. Uh, one is here on the north side, and I'm right in, on the shore of what's known as Grand Lagoon. And um, to the northeast is a shot to uh, Asia, Japan, uh, Western United States, and uh, I have another shot, essentially northwest, uh, toward Europe. Uh, when I get a chance, I love to operate out on what's known as Sandy Point, kind of the toe of the boot here. And um, at that location, I'm practically surrounded by salt water. Uh, I've also operated uh, over near what they call the kiddie pool. And I've worked uh, with the Alex Loop. I worked a whole lot of uh, South American and Central America uh, DX from that location. So we really have a saltwater playground here in Northwest Florida. Uh, I picked up this uh, chart off the internet. It's called uh, Ground Effects for Vertical Antennas. Um, it's the uh, response uh, based on elevation angle and of course there's no radiation straight up from the vertical but the uh, low angle radi radiation uh, varies with the uh, uh, ground that the vertical is over and uh, these lines family of curves here uh, show that uh, poor uh, can hurt your response and uh, it increasingly gets better with better earth uh, and the the best curve is for uh, a vertical over salt water. Uh, this is a chart of ground conductivity uh, in the United States. Uh, it's in millimoles and millimoles per meter and uh, the numbers range from one to 30. Uh, here in Northwest Florida, our number is one, which is the lowest on the chart. And that's due to, we have a lot of sandy soil and it's not very conductive. Uh, seawater conductivity, however, is vastly different. Uh, it is 5,000 millimo per meter. So with our local ground conductivity being one millimo per meter, uh, that's a 5,000 to one ratio. Uh, one of my favorite vertical antennas is the N6 BT Bravo 7K. It's a multi-band vertical. I purchased it from N6 BT, uh, Tom Schiller. Uh, Tom happens to be a member of Team Vertical that takes advantage of the saltwater effect. Uh, I liked it so much, I later bought a second Bravo 7K vertical so I could set up a two element parasitic array. I also recommend reading the book, Array of Light by Tom Schiller, N6BT. Uh, here's a photo of the Bravo 7K on the saltwater shore. Uh, this is typically how I deploy it. Uh, the, um, it has a tripod and so the antennas actually over the uh, very shallow water at the shore. Uh, it has a vertical radiator, which is about 18 feet tall. It has two radials. They're not quarter wave radials. 
um, and it has a box with some loading coils for the vertical element and the radials. And the band that you operate is, is done by setting the lengths of these elements. They're telescoping aluminum tubes. And um, you also uh, set jumpers for the uh, loading coil in the box. All right, um, equally important to my uh, study about saltwater effect is Whisper, a weak signal propagation reporter. It was invented by Professor Joe Taylor, K1JT, and it's just one of the wonderful modes that he uh, has given us. And um, uh, with Whisper, uh, beacon transmitters are picked up by receivers and uh, the information that they pick up is uh, related, relayed to a database so you can get results in real time on the internet. Uh, this is an example of some spots, whisper spots on the whispernet.org website. And these, the beacon uh, that I've deployed uh, is uh, here uh, in Northwest Florida. And all the other little symbols are for receivers that have picked up uh, the signal from the beacon. Uh, a real innovation, I believe, is the whisper-like whisper beacon. Uh, it doesn't require a computer to run. It's self-contained except for the power supply, which can be a USB power pack. It has a 200 milliwatt output. Um, it's super portable. I've only used it on 20 meters. Uh, it can be used on other bands. But uh, when you purchase a Whisper Lite, you also get access to DXplorer, uh, which gives you some um, advanced tools for uh, uh, seeing results for the spots of your beacon. Uh, this is the Whisper Lite in the field. Uh, it has a little uh, push button on it to start it. It's important to start it on a even two minute interval um, so it can be synchronized with the rest of the whisper system. Uh, it also has a uh, LED to give the status. And the larger box is a little USB power pack uh, to uh, supply the power. Uh, this is uh, just the uh, opening page of the uh, Soda Beams D Explorer web app. Um, it gives you a lot of ways to look at uh, your spots uh, that goes beyond uh, the whispernet.org site. And particularly important, it has uh, a facility to pick up simu simultaneous spots of your beacon. And those are spots, um, well, a beacon or more than one beacon in that a receiver can receive more than one beacon uh, in a whisper cycle. And this will let you focus on the ones that are simultaneous. I uh, also developed a uh, Microsoft Access Spots database that I could put all my uh, tests in and do some uh, calculations and queries that go beyond uh, what even DX Explorer, D Explorer does for you. Uh, well, the crux of my talk is uh, a saltwater effect experiment. And here's how it goes. Uh, you choose a saltwater shore location uh, and an inland location, and you locate, in my case, a Bravo 7K vertical and whisper light beacon at each location. 
Uh, each beacon I'm using a different call sign. I borrowed our club call sign for one beacon. Uh, you run the beacons for a period of time at the 200 milliwatt setting. Uh, you're careful to start the beacons on the same even minute. And then um, uh, after after a run, you can analyze the data with DXplore and Microsoft Access. And it's important to note that we're not comparing antennas, we're comparing locations and not antennas. Uh, three assumptions for the experiment is that the two Bravo 7K verticals are the same. Uh, that's pretty easy to do because the uh, tubes can be measured and set to be exactly alike. And the Bravo 7K is very repeatable. If you repeat the links, uh, it will give you the same uh, SWR. So it'll be resonant uh, where you desire it to be. Also, uh, I'm assuming the two whisper, be whisper light beacons have the same output. Uh, Richard Soda Beam says the whisper lights will be very close in performance, usually better than 0.5 dB. I did do a spot check with a low power watt meter and I couldn't detect any difference. <clears throat> a third assumption is um, I'm only using simultaneous spots to do comparisons. Uh, this is the location for the first test I did. Uh, it is at St. Andrews State Park. And uh, the uh, setup on the um, saltwater shore is at my favorite location, uh, next where a picnic table is. And uh, the inland location is 700 feet back. Uh, near a parking lot. Um, I, I will mention that setting up and running this experiment uh, uh, takes some uh, labor. Uh, it also act takes two people um, and my uh, uh, assistant in this is Dennis, WA6, Dennis Walker, WA6QKN. And um, so we each uh, took care of an antenna and then we coordinated uh, synchronizing the start of the two beacons. Uh, here's the results of my first test. Um, I guess I only ran about an hour and I only got nine simultaneous spots. But those spots, uh, gave me a um, average SNR delta of uh, 10.8 dB with a standard deviation of 2.32 dB. Uh, just a little explanation on the chart. Uh, along the bottom uh, on the horizontal axis is SNR delta bends. So uh, for an SNR delta between the saltwater location and the inland location, uh, there was one spot. Uh, there was a difference of nine dB. Uh, there were two um, spots and it follows along. So this kind of gives you a distribution of the spots in regard to the uh, difference or the delta. And in this case, as I mentioned, uh, the um, um, delta is 10.8 dB. Uh, that's pretty substantial. Uh, although I didn't collect a lot of data, uh, I knew that this was something that I should keep studying. So um, I decided to do a second test at Okaloosa Island. Uh, has uh, salt water on the north side um, and the south, but nevertheless, I used the northern shore. And it's the same affair. 
uh, salt water versus inland, except the distance uh, was only 200 feet in this case. Uh, the results are on this uh, uh, chart, and I had uh, 40 simultaneous spots, and uh, uh, here's the distribution, and the uh, average SNR delta was 4.7 dB, with a standard deviation of 1.9. So, uh, in the this case, as the previous one, the inland uh, uh, beacon with antenna never uh, it outperformed the saltwater beacon. Uh, if it had, I would have had a negative, um, uh, some, ne some values in negative bins. Uh, this happens to be a snapshot of uh, uh, whisper spots uh, during that test. And on the left is inland, um, which you can take a look at, but it's very much more crowded here on the right, which is the uh, salt water and um, beacon. And also it picked up some DX uh, toward Europe and in South America. Uh, one thing to note, as far as the comparison goes, I'm just using simultaneous spots. So um, I do keep a record of spots that one beacon gets that the other doesn't, but the, uh, the uh, values that I'm giving you are based on simu simultaneous spots. Um, I did another test uh, I was really uh, concerned that maybe one beacon would win over the other. Uh, maybe it was better or the antennas were different. Uh, I'll note on the previous test that I used a different beacon at the saltwater, but the saltwater still won, uh, won out. And here, uh, you can't see the antennas, but I located the two beacons and antennas uh, in a large field here. Uh, there was salt water nearby, but the beacons were uh, uh, back from the salt water at an equal distance. And uh, so this I call the baseline test. It's just comparing to the two setups and they really should be equal. Uh, I really was quite impressed by the results. Um, there is some variation, but uh, one beacon was better than the other uh, in equal number of times. Uh, and and uh, as you can see here, uh, things, the average SNR delta was 0 0.24 dB. So, uh, uh, the deviation 1.96, uh, 55 spots. So this really gave me a good feeling that uh, we had the e proper equipment uh, and my assumptions were true that the beacons and the antennas were uh, quite similar. Uh, I did one more test uh, which involved a dipole so it was a vertical versus dipole test. Uh, the uh, three poles are supporting a 20 meter dipole. Uh, I've used that dipole for portable operating. Uh, it's near the saltwater shore. Off to the left is the, you can't see it, but it's the, same, the vertical antenna. Uh, so we ran the test for this situation. Uh, here's the results. There's a fair amount of scatter in these results, but the uh, vertical um, uh, did better than the dipole and the SNR delta average was 9.53. Uh, 
with a standard deviation of 4.32. So all the spots um, were better with the vertical except for one spot out of 33. So that's the indication that the vertical um, on the salt water would be better um, than this particular dipole. Um, uh, so uh, that's very promising for the vertical. So a recap of the results. Um, uh, the first test, the uh, salt water versus the inland vertical. Uh, the salt water uh, setup always beat the inland for any spot. Uh, the average uh, SNR delta was 10.8 at 700 feet. Uh, essentially, the same test at another location gave uh, 4.7 dB SNR delta at 200 feet. It could be that the antenna at 200 feet was actually influenced by the salt water somewhat, and maybe that would explain why the, um, the delta wasn't as much, but even at this, it is uh, significant. Uh, the two inland ver verticals, uh, one was better 22 times, the other was better 24, and they were equal 19 times. Uh, this suggests that the two beacons and antennas are equivalent. The average SNR delta was 0 0.24. Uh, the low dipole versus the saltwater vertical, the vertical was better for 32 times out, or 32 spots out of 33, and the average uh, SNR delta was 9.53. Well, my conclusion is uh, this limited measured data suggests that the saltwater effect is fact and not fiction. So uh, my anecdotal uh, experience was confirmed by some uh, measured data. Um, and obviously, uh, this is important for portable operators. Uh, they should consider taking advantage of the saltwater effect to have a lot more fun. Uh, also, the whisper-like beacons and analysis tools can help quantify different configurations to find out what's advantageous for portable operations. So you could dream up other scenarios um, and, and use uh, a similar uh, type uh, uh, methodology. Well, um, this study is not necessarily over. Obviously, I could collect more data to get statistically better results. Um, and also, uh, could do more work to study the effect of the antenna's distance from the shore. Uh, also, um, analysis could be done based on the direction and the distance of the spots. Uh, I didn't take that in account in the numbers you've seen, but um, I can uh, bend the data uh, based on uh, distance, there's enough information to do that. And I can also bend it in, um, in direction. So you could calculate the uh, SNR delta for uh, diff the distances um, and, and the directions uh, taken together. And you might see whether or not it it is helping the low, the longer distances better than the short. And also you could um, help verify that uh, the effect is primarily uh, when the other station is across the salt water. So uh, that would be some more study that could be done. Well, calling all scientists uh, I'm interested in feedback on how to make the experiment better. Uh, I would love to see others do similar experiments. And this could be a science fair experiment for some young people or 
even a master's thesis. Uh, I'd love to have uh, the local college uh, uh, assist me, uh, have their students assist me, <laughs> and maybe I get some free uh, labor out of that. Uh, the credits, uh, big thanks to Dennis Walker for helping me conduct the experiments. Uh, he joins me on most of my outdoor uh, adventures. Uh, thanks to Richard of Soda Beans. Uh, obviously, the Whisper Light is a great product, and he gave me some assistance and guidance for using the product. And thanks to Eric, uh, 4Z1UG and the Expo team for giving me an opportunity to present. And at this point, uh, we would love to hear questions and answers. Uh, I'll be uh, standing by uh, to uh, chat with you. All right, thank you very much, and uh, 73.